The information provided on this podcast is intended to be educational and informational only and is not considered to be formal legal advice. The listener should not take or refrain from taking action based on its content. Any listener in need of legal opinion upon which to rely in decision making should consider formally engaging an attorney to review relevant facts in detail and examine the pertinent law as it applies to those facts. Welcome to Real Estate Milestones, where we explore fascinating topics in commercial real estate with knowledgeable industry experts. I'm your host, Ben Malik, and I'm a young real estate professional who is passionate about adding value to people's lives through the incredible power of real estate. My goal is to help you discover what the heck is going on in the industry and how you can get involved. This is Real Estate Milestones, where your future in real estate lies just around the corner. Hello, everybody. So we have Yona Weiss on today, which I'm very excited about because Yona is the cost seg king. You'll learn what that means during this episode, so stay tuned. But Yona is an expert networker and a LinkedIn guru. So we got a lot of networking things to learn from, from him as well. But um, let's start with Yona. Can you tell us a little bit? Uh, first, where are you turning, t- tuning in from? Tuning in today from the holy city of Jerusalem in Israel. So working remotely, which is great. Uh, Anyone who thinks it can't be done, it certainly can. Uh, Been doing it before it was cool, right? So (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. So yeah, can you tell us a little little bit about yourself and your journey in real estate? Absolutely. And first of all, thanks so much for having me on the podcast. This is a, a lot of fun. One of my favorite pastimes being a guest on podcasts. As uh, you may be able to tell if you look on the internet at all, um, <laughs> totally. I've been uh, I've been in real estate for only about six six or seven years or, or so, which seems like a really long time at this point. But uh, from the gray hairs in my beard, you can tell I'm a little bit older. And so I spent about 15 years as a teacher before that. And really, that my passion is in that. And even now in the real estate realm and, and that I'm in, I find myself in that capacity a lot, teaching people, helping people and, and doing for others more than even for myself. So that's a little bit about me. Um, like I said, I'm actually based in Israel. So I've worked for a company based in, uh, based in the States and in New Jersey. And all my work is remote, although I do travel back and forth quite a bit, but I have uh, six kids and a great family and just living the life. Awesome. Yeah. And I can definitely tell you're a natural teacher from uh, just the, the way you articulate things very, very clearly, which uh, I think you're about to do. But before, <laughs> before we do that, um, what is your first milestone in real estate? The first milestone I would say is, I mean, I got my real estate broker's license. That I guess was a milestone because uh, you have to pass a test to do that. And I was like, wow, okay. I didn't really study so much to, to get past that test, but it, it, uh, I guess that's a milestone. Yeah, that's one of my milestones too. It wasn't the hardest test, but I definitely learned a lot because my, my parents said they, they learned a lot just from buying a house. I'm like, well, how many get those skills before buying a house? So I took the test, learned a little bit, and now I can earn commissions on, on real estate deals. So that's cool. Very cool. And now yeah. you got to go buy a house though and learn some more. Right. Yeah, I know. That's a learning through experience. Definitely a, a key. So um, yeah, what is a cost segregation for anyone who might not know? Yeah, cost segregation. It's a, if you don't know by now, um, well, no, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy concept. Essentially when you buy a property besides your personal residence, any type of business or investment rental property, the IRS allows you to take an income tax deduction called depreciation, which means you're able to take a write-off of the entire value of your property based on, uh, what you bought it for. So if you bought a property for a million dollars, you can now write off a million dollars from your income tax, but you can't do it all at once. You have to spread it out over this long period of time, 39 years or or 27 and a half years, depending if it's residential or commercial. What cost segregation is, is just an advanced form of that depreciation. So instead of taking an equal deduction every single year for that 39 year period, you're actually able to break down that cost or segregate that cost of the purchase into different categories and different things that the IRS says different components of the property actually depreciate at a faster rate, at a five-year or seven-year or 15-year rate. And by doing this, we call it like an engineer-based breakdown or study of the property, you're able to, which we call a cost segregation study, uh, you're able to actually take much larger deductions at a in the earlier years of ownership. So in in 
essentially it's a cash flow tool or strategy basically to use those potential tax deductions uh, right now. So instead of like waiting a long time, right? If you have like this pool of potential tax deductions and you can pull from that and take a lot of them right now, that's really where it's uh, most beneficial. Yeah. And as you know, the name of the game is in real estate. And one of the what people's favorite parts is the, the tax advantages and the, um, I guess, the wealth building as a result too. So um, definitely a powerful strategy, but just to kind of cement the idea more, can you kind of give us an example with some numbers and maybe a uh, you know, paint a picture for us about how, how one would actually work. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's go to the back to example, right? Let's say buy a property for a million dollars. Okay. If it's a residential property, let's say it's multifamily, right? So if you buy, if it's in California, that means it's probably a duplex. And if it's in, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Alabama, it's probably like a 40 unit building, right? But a million dollars can go a long way depending on where you invest. And let you always have to, and I should mention that you always have to allocate a certain amount to land, which does not depreciate. So let's say you're taking off 15% towards land, okay, which leaves you with $850,000. That's what's called your depreciation basis. That's the amount that you can depreciate or you can take as a tax deduction. Now, before I get into that, just to clarify, depreciation sounds like a negative term, but it's really not. Depreciation is just, when it, when it comes to tax deduction, it doesn't mean that your property is actually going down in value. It's just a borrowed term that the IRS gave for this tax deduction based on the principle that your property is going down in value because it's not intrinsic to the actual property itself. And what I mean by that is this deduction starts over the day that you buy a property. Okay, so you may buy a building that was built in, you know, 1952 and it's fully been fully depreciated or that value that you know is in the actual intrinsically in the building doesn't have that depreciation value of 27 and a half years but when you buy it today in 2022 you get to start that 27 and a half year schedule your depreciation schedule brand new based on you based on the owner and based on your purchase price so that's why i say it's not intrinsic it's really subjective and so it's a borrowed term so getting back to our numbers of $850,000 and now you may not be a numbers person, but this is pretty simple. If you take that and divide that by 27 and a half, you get about $30,000 just to keep it round. Which means if you were just take regular, what we call straight line regular depreciation, you would be getting a $30,000 tax deduction from your income tax each year. Now, what does that mean for a practical sense? Let's say you made $50,000 of income. Okay, that 30,000 reduces that taxable income, which means you're only paying taxes or only subject to tax on the remaining 20,000. So instead of being taxed on $50,000, because of that depreciation deduction, you're able to be taxed only on 20,000. So that in of itself is great. And that usually saves tons of people, you know, a lot of money through this real estate investing. Cost segregation, what it does is we break down a building into its you know, engineering components. And so we'll find things like what's called personal property that's appreciated on a five-year schedule, like furniture, fixtures, right? Appliances, uh, you name it, basically anything non-structural like cabinets or countertops, even flooring or window treatments. There are so many different things. And we find the value of what those components are. And then you can take that tax deduction on a five-year schedule. So in the first five years, you may be taking 20% of your property in that five-year category. So back to our numbers, 850,000, right? Take 20% of that. You're looking at about $170,000 of extra tax deductions. So you split that up over a five-year period. You're basically more than doubling your tax deduction over those first five years. And there's something called bonus depreciation, which allows you to take that entire amount in the first year. You have the option to do that. So instead of a $30,000 tax deduction, you could literally get in the first year $170,000 or maybe even, it can be even more depending on the property. It can be up to $200,000, $300,000 of tax write-off in that first year just because you're doing this conservation study. So that's really the power of this because again, if you're making more money, especially like real estate brokers or anything like that, where you can be making a lot of commissions, you can literally use these deductions to totally wipe out your income tax liability and pay zero income tax. Yeah. And so the difference between a depreciation and maybe, um, let's say, like utilities, like there's a, 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 it's a paper loss or a paper deduction versus like an actual, you don't actually pay it in cash. You know, you don't pay yeah. someone for depreciation. You just right. deduct it. And it's only, so you actually, you still get the cash, but it just looks like from a tax, perspe a tax perspective that you're not 
take getting that income because the depreciation tax yield is just what you can call it. But um, yeah, so it's a- That's a great yeah. point. Yeah. Because like you said, if you're, you're paying the electrician or you're paying the electricity bill or the gas bill or whatever it is, that's money that's coming out of your pocket. And you got to pay that. Yes, you can use that as a deduction, right? On your taxes, but you've already paid that out. Depreciation is not like that. You get to reduce that on your taxes. You don't pay anything. So that's a great point. Yeah. So, I mean, so it seems a little bit too good to be true that you really are not paying anything. Like this is, this is amazing. Like <laughs> when, when do we have to pay these, these costs? Is there, is there ever a time where this deduction cashes back up to us? Like, how does that work on the, on the, is it, you know, like on the back end or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. In fact, many people, right, do the best they can to just continue scaling, buying more properties and create losses so that you literally never have to pay. But whenever you sell a property, and this is maybe what you're referring to, there is something called depreciation recapture tax. So it's similar to capital gain tax, uh, where when you sell a property for a profit, you are subject to a tax on that gain, the amount that you, you know, made on the sale. That's called capital gain tax. Re recapture tax or depreciation recapture tax is similar to that. It's called the unrealized gain, meaning you've taken these deductions over the course of ownership. You now are going to be subject to a tax on the amount of depreciation. So it's not necessarily all a free, free ride, but it doesn't mean you're paying it back. And in fact, many people through different strategies like a 1031 exchange can defer that tax as long as, as well as the capital gain tax, defer that recapture tax or through other methods of creating passive losses, like creating, doing a cost segregation in the sale uh, in the year that you sell another property, you can actually get enough losses to offset that. So like go back to our example where you had like, did a cost segregation and got like a $200,000 tax deduction, right? Well, let's say you sold another property in the same year and you're like, well, now I got to pay this recapture tax and that recapture tax is like 100,000 because 100, I, I used all this depreciation up front. Well, guess what? You can use that $200,000 losses from the cost irrigation to offset that $100,000 of gain from the recapture tax on the sale of another property. So it's not like you're definitely paying back everything uh, or, or anything at all. So it's just this is a strategy and like any good strategy has to be thought through on a long-term basis and it combines with other strategies. And obviously if you're planning on buying more properties or keep buying properties each year, you can actually use this to virtually never pay. Right. So let's, let's keep playing out this scenario. <laughs> how do we make sure we never have to pay taxes? How do we keep this roll? How, how do you keep rolling this over and, and continuing this uh, on for as long as possible? Yeah, and when does it end? And you know, yeah, <laughs> legally, obviously, obviously, the best thing to do. It's the first thing you have to do is have a good tax advisor. I would say that's the first step because tax planning is really the difference between you know just having an accountant who just does your taxes and just basically punches numbers and files numbers. That's not that's not going to help you grow, and that's not going to help you um, make sure that you're capitalizing and getting all the deductions that you can. But the best way to do it is just to continue uh, every single year buy a property, at least one. And sometimes people will buy a property literally just for those tax benefits. I don't necessarily recommend that because buying a property should be done from a business plan. It should be worthwhile, right? All the other things should fall into place. And then on top of it, obviously you have these tax benefits that come along with it. So best case scenario, have set it up from the beginning, get a tax advisor, someone on your team that can show you the best way to do it. And number two, continue investing, right? As long as you can. And using other tax strategies like a 1031 exchange to defer those taxes out further. And yeah, I think if you go back to episode six, uh, we got Brett Swartz who talks about the deferred sales trusts, which um, definitely can, it can, I think from my assumption, it could pair up well with a cost seg. If, is, that, is that the case? It certainly could, yeah. So as you can tell, Yona knows a lot about cost segregation, but um, he's also, we, we call him the cost segregation king. So I, I want to know did, who came up with that name. And uh, like, you know, I think you, you, you own the crown, you deserve the crown, but uh, I want to know where that came from. You know, I was very involved in LinkedIn for, you know, for uh, quite a while. And I, I found, you know, I was looking for a personalized hashtag, you know, and this was years ago, it was going back probably like four years ago or something that like, oh, I need like a, a person, a branded hashtag, like what should that be? And I reached out to my audience, you know, like reached out on and got a lot of people commenting, it should be this, it should be that, right? 
And, uh, and it just came, it was like a combination of a few people were like the king of cost segregation or, you know, the cost that grew, whatever it was. And it was just, it sounded right. It just, it came together. So it really was a combination of a, a bunch of people together. And then it just stuck from then. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It definitely. You have a an awesome following on LinkedIn, a lot of engagement, a lot of input, you know, the comment thread is always like a, a good conversation. And it's, it's, yeah, I really love that about, um, yeah, I want to learn how to, how to do that with my LinkedIn too. Um, but before we go into that, I, I have a, a goal. I wanted to ask you questions about cross segregation that you've never heard before, which I know would be very hard because you got tons of podcasts, but um, so here, I'll, I'll, a couple that I'll, I'll try. So what is the most obscure thing you've ever depreciated at a faster schedule? <laughs> the most obscure? Well, that's challenging. I mean, we've done the company I work for, Madison Spec, we've done over 20,000 cost segregation studies. So on every asset class possible, what's something recently that came up was we did a uh, this agricultural property and it had all these different components to it. Like I had like almond trees and, you know, fig trees and, and different things. And I, I learned that different types of trees have different depreciation, you know, deductions, which uh, was uh-huh. something that was fascinating to me, you know, because agriculture is its, its whole, you know, category of, of investment. So that was probably something really interesting. Yeah. that that is really interesting that there's different schedules too. I mean, I, yeah, that's, that's crazy. I can't even imagine. I didn't even know trees could be de- depreciated. Yeah, because they're they're really assets. They're you know you, typically you have things like what are called uh, like landscaping and any type of plants that would be considered landscaping. If you plant trees or anything like that, those are called land improvements in that category. Land improvements depreciate on a fifteen year schedule, uh, so that has value, right? If you put in palm trees in your property, there's a lot of value in that, and you can depreciate that value, right? Because it, again, we're thinking about property. We're talking about uh, it's not land itself, but it's what's on top of the land. And so that has value. Uh, when you come to different types of you know, trees and even vineyards, very interestingly, depreciate on a 10-year schedule. So you have a different special category specifically for that type of asset. Wow, that's amazing. Well, so what, what object or what uh, thing that you can depreciate has the weirdest depreciation schedule? Maybe like what's the shortest depreciation schedule of, of anything? Um, you know, f- the five year is the main category. That's the shortest depreciation schedule. Um, and then you have what's called the bonus depreciation, which allows you to take that in the first year in a one year. But there are a few things that are on a three year depreciation schedule, a uh, very unique type of assets. And um, I'm running a blank on, on what some of those things might be right now, but they have to do with, they have to do with some sort of um, like oil related to oil and, and gas production stuff like that. Interesting. Cool. So what can you not depreciate? Well, you can't depreciate land. Okay. So if you buy like a, a parcel of land and like, yeah, I got this awesome property I bought. Right. Well, you can't depreciate it until it's a rental property until it's, you know, done, done like that. And then, but everything else is essentially depreciable, which means you can take any time you buy anything, uh, you can write it off as a tax deduction. And so it's just a question of at, at what length, right? At what time period can you write those things off? But everything is depreciable uh, if it's part of real estate. Oh, beyond real estate. Is there anything you could depreciate? Oh, beyond, beyond real estate? estate? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah there, I mean, it's a, new, a second question, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I mean, there are plenty of things that you can depreciate, business uh, equipment and anything that is uh, related to a business there are, are so many things. So there's, there's a resource that the IRS is um, basically the code that, that defines all of this is called the, the MACRS, M-A-C-R-S, which is, stands for the Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System. And so this essentially, this system, if you will, defines the, the useful life, right, of every single type of thing out there. So even, you know, car, if you buy a car, it depreciates, you can take as a tax write-off, right? Um, equipment anything, even like movie and film, like have their own type of tax deduction. It's really interesting, right? Oil and gas, like all these industries that are, have all these different tax deductions for them. And so this macros, this cost recovery system defines what all those, you know, components are and how you can write them off. So the cost segregation itself is specifically for real estate, because if you think about it, if you have equipment, you know exactly what that costs. And so you can write that off. Okay. But 
the problem and the, the reason why there's a need for conservation when it comes to real estate is because you buy a property and it has in it all these different components, but you don't know what the value of all those individual things are unless you can break it down. Um, otherwise, you're just going to depreciate everything in this lump sum over a 39-year period. Okay, so that's where the conservation comes in that we break down all the individual components within that purchase. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so, um, you know, who or when does it make sense to get a cost segregation study? And like, you know, who would benefit the most or, you know, who wouldn't benefit from one necessarily too? Yeah, the best time to get it is really because, as I mentioned, it's a strategy. It makes most sense when you need it most, okay? So a lot of people like to get it done in the first year of ownership because you're getting your taxes set up the right way from the beginning. Um, but you can get it done even retroactively if you've owned a property for years, you can get it done. So there are those options there. Um, the other thing I, I would say in terms of who's going to benefit the most is someone who is defined as a real estate professional. So that means that if you spend the majority of your time in the real estate trader business, so if you're a broker, this is for you. Meaning if you're a real estate broker, you also should own real estate so you can get this depreciation deduction. Otherwise, if you're not a real estate professional, you're going to be limited to use these tax deductions just to offset your rental income or passive income. So there are certain rules and limitations when it comes to who can benefit from these deductions more than anyone else. And the biggest uh, person that's most most for is, like I said, a real estate professional. Right. So, I mean, at that point, every loss is a gain as yeah. long as you're making like active income. So that's really exciting. Um, I'm, I have my license and that doesn't necessarily make me a real estate professional, but I'm using it regularly. It would be, I would be considered one. So, yeah, cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's an important point because, you, you know, there's a lot of tax advantages that come along with real estate. And there's a lot of advantages that come along with being a passive investor, but they don't necessarily all align. So, I mean, you know, what kind of things, I mean, yeah, like I, I'd want to touch on the advantages of passive investing. If we're also going to touch on the, you know, what you can't do with it, but I kind of want to make some of those distinctions. So can you uh, touch on that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, you can, like I said, you can do it at any point. There are certain types of properties that have more benefit than others. Um, and a certain price point really makes more sense. So for example, if you buy a hundred thousand dollar property, your, your benefit is going to be less because you're just taking a portion or proportion of that tax deduction of that total amount upfront. So the bigger the property is, or the more value to the purchase price, the more benefit you're going to have, because again, it's just proportionate. Yeah. I know that sometimes you use like the, the $500,000 mark is like a, 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 you know, kind of a, a rough bit estimate for like when it really becomes valuable. Yeah. That's, I mean, I use that as like a, a rule of thumb, but really any property, um, I'd say valued over, you know, purchased for over two, 300,000 is definitely worthwhile looking into, especially if you're a real estate professional, because at that point, like I said before, you, it's not geared to the property by itself. Uh, it's, you know, it's really for any, anyone or anything, you know, you can use those deductions. Great. And then can I go in and do a cost segregation study or do I need, do I need you to come in to do it? Yeah, I mean, anyone could do this theoretically, but uh, if you're ever audited, you're going to be, you're going to be uh, screwed basically, right? Because you need to have a professional uh, get it done because there's so many requirements when it comes to the IRS's tax code. There's something called the cost segregation audit techniques guide, which defines everything that needs to go into this. So there's like a whole numbering system. There's a whole, you know, nomenclature and referencing to the tax code for every type of asset. So, you know, the report that our company does is, you know, like 80, 90, 100 pages long. And it's very, very detailed that goes into all this stuff. It's not just about like coming up, you know, throwing a dart at the wall and figuring out, okay, let's take 20% of our property as a fat, you know, bonus depreciation. I wish it was that easy. So you do need a qualified, you know, cost study done by a company that is reputable. Great. Okay. Well, I'm glad to get that, yeah, <laughs> to know that for sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you check out Yona on LinkedIn, you'll see he's definitely got some, some techniques that he's mastered, but I wanted to kind of get some advice regarding like, you know, how do you use LinkedIn to, to maximize your, your network and, you know, and then, yeah, if you have any networking, I guess I don't call them tricks necessarily, but like advice that you could share. I, I'm sure everyone would appreciate that a lot. For sure. LinkedIn is, is tremendous. 
you know, for a couple of reasons. Number one is because you, even though it's social media, it's very professional and it's more business oriented. So if you're looking to grow your network and they say, you know, your network is your net worth, right? There's, there's a lot of truth to that. And the more you network, the more you're connected with people and actually interact, you end up, you know, doing business and you end up, you know, having, having things in common with other people that you wouldn't necessarily otherwise know. So a couple tips and tricks that I like to recommend constantly is number one, make sure that your, your page or your profile is up to date and looks professional. It literally can take, you know, anywhere from like 20 minutes to like an hour, just to actually spend time and making it look like full and like you're a real person because Google favors LinkedIn more than almost any other website whatsoever, which is incredible. If you're going to do business with someone, first thing you're going to do is Google their name. Okay. And if they don't have like an extremely common name, then you're likely going to find them on the internet. And if, especially if they have social media or any kind. And for some, if, if you're listening to this right now and you have a LinkedIn profile, just, you know, stop, especially if you're driving, right? Stop and Google your name, Google your name and see what comes up. The first thing probably is going to be your LinkedIn profile, or at least on the first page. First, I mean, literally, it's incredible, which means that anyone who's Googling you is probably going to check out your LinkedIn profile. And if it looks real and it looks like, oh, you're a real person, oh, and you're professional, oh, and you know, you're active or, or you have, you've done X, Y, and Z, or you have any type of media that you can put up there. Like if you've been on a podcast or have written any articles or been featured or done any YouTube videos or anything like that, you can put that on your LinkedIn profile and people can reference that. And so it's a great, it's a free basically uh, landing page for you. And so that's number one, a huge, huge, huge uh, asset uh, for so many reasons. But number two, I would say is be involved, be engaged on the platform. I see LinkedIn as like a 24 hour networking event, literally. So if you go to a business networking event, you're going to meet people and you may eventually like do business with them and the more time you spend with them, et cetera. So this is a platform that you can meet people and you can engage with other people's content and even post your own, right? And put yourself out there. That's, that's great, but you don't necessarily have to do that. You can, you can just be there and be engaging with other people's content. And by doing that, you can become known and, and people will start to recognize you and find out who you are. And if you have something to sell, or if you have something that you're offering of any kind like that, that's the best way to get known because other people will see you and they're like, oh, this is the guy that, you know, does this or that. Yeah, that's, that's incredibly powerful advice. And I, I definitely, um, you know, I try to implement that as much as possible. And um, yeah, there's obviously a lot I can learn from, from seeing how you do your posts. It's like, Oh yeah. It's like, I really want to answer your question. I really want to like talk about the topic, you know? So it's like, yeah, it's really powerful. And um, so besides uh, LinkedIn, you know, how else do you suggest people um, or like, what, do, what should people pay attention to when they're trying to connect with other people and um, you know, build their network, uh, you know, in person or online, but uh, not necessarily through LinkedIn. You know, there's so many, so many different tools out there, but I mean, nothing beats, meeting people in person. So if you can get out there or get to any like conferences or anything like that, or meetups, even nowadays I have like online meetups. Like I host a, a weekly meetup on zoom, uh, you know, so people come throughout the country and anyone's welcome to join us every Wednesday at 7 PM. We just have a guest speaker on a different real estate topic and you do networking afterwards. And so you meet people and you get to know people and you spend time with people, um, and you end up doing business and you end up investing or end up partnering or end up doing that stuff. It's, it's so incredible, but it's spending the time, it's putting yourself out there and uh, you'll see the difference. Awesome. So uh, before we jump into the lightning round, I want to ask a question beyond business. But um, so, I mean, part of what I want to do in business is help people and add value to the world and make my mark and, and leave a legacy. Um, I definitely, you know, think about the idea of tikkun alum or to heal, heal the world is, 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 a, is a big value to me. But how, I mean, how is I'm sure that's a value to you as well. And I kind of want to know, like, beyond business, like, how do you implement this value into your life? Absolutely. It's literally on, it's, it's everything. That's really what it's all about. You know, seeing how you can give, how you can help other people going out of your way. Business is the best way to actually, um, to do that. And so 
you know, a lot of people think like business, oh, business, what do you mean? How can you give if you're doing business? How can you help people in doing business? Well, it really depends. Like, what is your, you know, how is your business set up? Like, how are you doing? If your business, first of all, besides for the fact that the more money you make, the more people you can actually help. I mean, if your mindset is that, like a lot of people, especially in the Jewish tradition, a lot of others, we have, um, you know, a law that you're supposed to give 10%, right? A tithing, which the word tithe comes from the word 10th, right? Which comes from the, the Hebrew word, right? To, to take off a, a 10% of your income. We do even more than that, right? You can give, you can give more, but the more you make, the more you can give. And so that's something that besides for within your business, but I look at it, everything that I do, like, how can I help people? How, if I'm trying to educate people, right? This is going to help people save money on their taxes, right? This is going to help them grow their own businesses. And so going out of your way to do that. So I definitely have, you know, in terms of monetarily, I have organizations that I, that I support um, individuals. I definitely like to, to find people that I know that are struggling and kind of find ways that I can help them in uh, to get back on their feet, obviously helping someone find a job or is the highest form uh, of charity, highest form of helping someone. So, you know, just allowing them to, you know, they say a teacher, or a teacher man to fish, right? If you give him a fish, he eats for a day, teach a man to fish, he eats for a lifetime. That concept is so powerful because if you literally can help someone get on their feet, you're, you're saving the whole world. Right. And yeah, help them help themselves. And then they can help other people help themselves. And it's just a amazing network and, you know, spreading this, this value crowd in, you know, I guess reducing suffering if you wanted to take the, the Buddhist perspective too. So, um, yeah. And like, for me, I take, I take a lot of time, you know, I, I don't have a huge business yet and I definitely want to get to a point where I can have a business and then run a foundation along alongside it that, you know, helps with the values that I, I am strong. I feel strongly about, but, um, you know, anyone, anyone in any position can always just, you know, take a moment to make someone smile send a text that makes someone smile. And then just, you can, that person can pass a smile along and along and, you know, next thing you know, next time you're sad, someone else is walking down the street and smiles and you just remember like, you know, you remember to smile. So I think this is power in the small things as well. Um, so great. Well, you ready for the lightning round? Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. So what superpower would you want if you could choose any superpower? Wow. I don't even know what superpowers exist. So <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, oh, that's a tough question. Yeah, Give me definitely. some choices. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So flying is very popular because you can, you can do comps from flying also helps with, uh, getting around, um, speed. I like speed. That's mine. I like super speed, super strength, telepathy, you know, Oh, telepathy. Right, that's going oh, x-ray vision, cost segregation from the outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. No, they're all great. I don't know. I, I think I'll have to go with, uh, you know, telepathy, maybe just trying to figure out, especially, you know, for my wife, like what's she really thinking, right? Yeah, right. Sometimes words don't necessarily align with the, the meaning. So yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Um, so what's your favorite book or what's the one that's helped you the most? You know, the most powerful book, there are so many, I mean, I've read literally thousands of books. Um, probably the biggest one, uh, that had the biggest impact on my life, I would say two. And they're both Jewish books. They're both like ancient Jewish, like not ancient, like hundreds of years old, but texts that um, totally changed my entire life and perspective. So one is called the Tanya, which is the Lubavitch uh, Chabad uh, written by uh, Mishnir Zalman. Incredible book, just brings a whole perspective. And the second one is called The Way of God, Derech Hashem. It's by Moshe Chaim Lutzato. It was a great rabbi in the 17th century. 18th century in Italy. And these two books totally changed my entire life and my outlook on literally everything that I do on a daily basis. So, you know, in terms of business books, there, there are tons of them. And I'm sure everyone else will talk about all those, <laughs> but I give a little bit of a different perspective here. Yeah, I definitely appreciate that. And, um, you know, I want to be a well-rounded person and, and, you know, pull things from everywhere. So, I mean, I definitely been reading a lot about um, Maimonides and his philosophies and and it's been a great journey. I'm taking a class, a Buddhism class, just for my philosophy major. And it's like, wait, like so many of these things are compatible with Judaism. Like who is talking about metaphysics and Judaism? And like, I was like, oh, that's okay. So I've learned some amazing things. Recently. There you go. <laughs> yeah, cool. So what motivates you to continue every day? 
you know, just trying to be the best person I can be, right? Trying, like you said, the tikkun olam, like every person is their own world. And so if we can be the best individual that we can be, obviously we have to have a guiding force of what that means, but uh, that's what motivates me is how can I help the most people and uh, how can I be the best person? Yeah, that's awesome. And what advice would you give to someone who wants to follow in your footsteps? Uh, be humble, right? That's the biggest thing. And, and part of that means continue learning, never be afraid to ask questions, never be afraid to think, oh, I already know that. I don't need to, to learn that again, or I don't need to listen to that. No, like keep studying, keep learning. There's, there's a tremendous amount to learn. And also, you know, if you're wrong, like figure it out, like say you're wrong, like you're, you're not, the world doesn't, you know, revolve around you. And that comes back to the point we we're talking about before, like help other people. The more people you help, the more you'll actually get out of it. 100%. And since I put you on the spot, I want to give you a chance for revenge. So uh, ask me any question you want to know about me. Any question. Okay. Of all the, uh, the albums on the back wall over there, which is your favorite? <laughs> the reason they're on the wall is because they're some of my favorite. But um, <laughs> so let's see. Uh, I'll say, okay, that's so tough. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a harder question. <laughs> yeah, it's probably the hardest question I've gotten asked. So, I mean, okay, well. Abbey Road, that's the most timeless piece of, of all time. Like, that's just, I mean, changed the game. Like, I think everything, every single thing that came out after it is influenced by it in some way. And I still think with all these, pro, like, all the things that's progressed from it, it's still, it's still the best. Um, so Abbey Road is one that I, I always go to. And uh, I love um, Oh Darling. That song always, always makes you feel so good. But um, when I'm feeling down, I always listen to my man, Bob Marley. I listen to a Redemption song by Bob Marley. That's my favorite Bob Marley song. And uh, Legend is just an incredible album. And then um, I've took History of Jazz last semester. So I got really into John Coltrane and Ornette Coleman. So these are, and then Miles Davis too. So those are my, three of my favorite jazz musicians. So um, Virgin Beauty is probably my favorite jazz album. It also has Jerry Garcia come on for a couple of the songs. So it's like mixing like, like I guess improvisational rock with, improvisational jazz and just blows my mind every time so that's a i couldn't give you a straight answer there but these are, <laughs> these are some of my my favorite albums definitely very cool awesome awesome well how can people find you well i know if they search you up for linkedin they'll definitely find you but how else can people uh find you and learn more about you yeah i mean like you said the best place is linkedin uh definitely let us know that you heard us on this podcast and we'll uh make a connection request through that. Um, but you can go to yonawice.com also, find out more about what we're working on. Awesome. And got any final, final remarks for the audience? Just keep on learning. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on. It's been a blast. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to get a lot of value out of this. So so uh, thanks on behalf of everyone as well. Thank you. It was great having you. Great spending right. time. Yeah, keep making milestones.